Oh, thank you, Stormy, and Dr. Hoffenmeister Kraut, and Aspen. Please, uh, really, thank you all for inviting me here. And I want to say a few words, if I might, that puts the topic of this conference into an uh, important global context. Uh, this is an incredibly important year. It's an important year for many reasons, not the least of which are elections taking place in Europe, the United States, not that anyone has noticed that, right, and around the world. Uh, more people than ever before will go to the polls this year. According to the New York Times, some two billion people, wrap your minds around that, two billion people, about half the adult population of the world, will have the chance to vote in over 60 countries in the United States and Europe, where all 27 member countries of the EU will vote in parliamentary elections, in addition to national and local elections. Nevertheless, according to Freedom Watch, which monitors the health of democracies, global freedom declined for the 17th consecutive year in 2023. 17 years in a row has seen the decline of democracies worldwide. As you know, Stormy has said, I'm a scholar of democracy. I've taught it, I've written about it, and I've practiced it now as ambassador. I learned it actually, the importance of democracies at the feet of my father as a child. Uh, from the youngest age I can imagine, my father told me the story of the demise of Weimar Germany, a democracy. Uh, he died when I was 16. So everything he taught me became really, really important to guide me in life. And he taught me how important it is to stand up, speak out early and often for democracy, against hatred, against anti-Semitism, and all forms of hatred if we care about preserving our democracy. So the question is, Democracy, we know, is on the ballot. And these elections will have, have effects for human rights, for economies, for international relations, and the prospects for peace in our world. So what is the question? The question is, will democracy win? That is a question that is on the ballot, and on our agendas. Will this year be a milestone in democracy's long journey to an ever more equitable world? And the answer isn't in a crystal ball. The answer is it's up to us. The stakes are really high. It is literally up to us, the citizens of the democracies of the world. And the fact that it's on the ballot is clear in the challenges we face. Putin's continued war on Iraq, Hamas's terrorist attack on Israel and the war in the Middle East, the market distorting behaviors of authoritarian leaders, and the potential disruptive and advancing effects of new technologies. From the beginning of his administration, President Biden has shown a deep commitment to strengthening the transatlantic alliance, a commitment for our shared values and interests, including the vigor of our transatlantic economy. In June 2021, less than six months after taking office, President Biden and European Commission President von der Leyen launched the idea of the Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council as a platform for collaboration on trade and technology. The TTC, 
as it's called, abbreviation, recognizes that the United States and Europe, representing almost half of the world's GDP, working together, we can have a tremendous, a tremendous and lasting impact on the rules and norms that affect both trade and existing and emerging technologies. The fifth ministerial meeting of the TTC was in January of this year, and the sixth ministerial will take place next month in Louvain. There are 10 working groups on issues ranging from climate and clean tech to data governance and export controls. Much of the work of the TTC takes place um, in Washington and Brussels and between Washington and Brussels. And the content and tenor of the discussions are not very well known in Berlin or Baden-Württemberg. Uh, they exist largely in a kind of Brussels bubble, if you will. But in this super election year, the issues on the multiple TTC platforms, the tables, are of enormous relevance. And that's what I want to speak to today. These issues include the resilience of transatlantic trade and international relations and investment, the strength of sustainable supply chains, the impact of emerging technologies, and the interrelationship of geopolitical and economic challenges. The TTC continues to address issues ranging from technology standards and export controls to non-market policies and economic coercion that we're seeing from authoritarian autocratic governments. What we're doing together is working to protect sensitive technologies so that they can't be used against us, and we're also moving to reduce unwanted dependencies. Uh, we are working to ensure that we have diversified, resilient, and secure supply chains in areas like critical minerals. And that's super important because if we are completely dependent, for example, on the People's Republic of China for certain critical minerals, then Xi, who is an authoritarian ruler, really has it in his power to shut down enormous parts of our economies. We've set very high standards for development, financing, infrastructure, and trade. And we've moved, very importantly, to advance climate goals, protect the environment, improve pandemic preparedness. Does anyone remember the pandemic? It's easy to forget it um, in our daily lives. It's pretty hard to forget those years and how traumatic they were. But we have to keep that in mind that we have to prepare for the next one, because if we're going to avert pandemics, we have to be prepared. And we also want to promote macroeconomic stability. And those are just a few of the really important things we need to do together. TTC is an indispensable tool in facilitating this transatlantic economic cooperation. It's helped us to stand up to the challenges to our democratic values and our economies that we hold so dear, and the freedoms and our security that we hold so dear. And if anyone doubts the ongoing challenges to those values, they need look no further than the death of Alexei Navalny last month. While we were at the Munich Security Conference, my colleagues and I and many people from Washington and many people from Berlin um, including the now widow of Alexei Navalny, um, we were given, as if we needed it, and I hope nobody here in this room needed it, a grim reminder of the brutality of Putin and his government to anyone who opposes him, 
including Russian citizens, Russia's neighbors, and other countries. We are transatlantic partners. And as transatlantic partners, the United States and Germany have stood together to support the brave people of Ukraine in the face of Russia's aggression. That is really the story of my start as ambassador, Stormy, just two and a half, not even two and a half years ago. This was my third Munich Security Conference this year. But I began with the priorities of encouraging, urging Germany to end Nord Stream 2 to modernize its military and to get up to 2% in its commitment to NATO. N very shortly after the end of the Munich Security Conference, February 24th to be precise, 2022, Russia reinvaded Ukraine. Germany had said to us, if that happens, we will be with you. We will be with you, and we will stand with you, and we will stand with Ukraine. Three days after the reinvasion, February 27th, Chancellor Schultz declared a Zeitenwende. It was the word of the year, right? And now Germany is the second largest contributor to Ukraine's security and humanitarian needs. Nobody would have predicted that three years ago, indeed two and a half years ago. But I heard that commitment at the Munich Security Conference. And that commitment, along with saying, we know we do things slower than we wish and you wish, but if we say we'll be with you, we will be with you. You can take our word. And indeed, Germany has lived up to that promise. And Germany plays a greater role in NATO and the EU today than perhaps ever before. And that's not a luxury, it's a necessity. And as much as Germans will say to me how much we need, as Germans say, the United States, you need to know the United States needs Germany. We need our transatlantic partners. And we need them for security. We need them for the defense of our democracy. And yes, we need them for trade and investment because those three things are mutually interdependent. Those three things are what makes not simply or not even mainly the political classes or the business leaders and the business CEOs or the heads of foundations move forward and thrive. That's what makes our citizens security and freedom and prosperity possible. We should never ever take that for granted. Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine was a stark reminder of the risks of dependence on authoritarian states for critical components of our supply chains. Dozens of countries came together to deny Russia much of the technology that they need to conduct the war. And through that effort, we built new bridges between our alliances and Europe and in the Indo-Pacific. And make no mistake about it, we will be with Ukraine as long as it takes. Chancellor Schultz has said that. President Biden has said that. And that is a bipartisan view in our country. Despite the problems of our Congress, the vast majority of our Congress people and the majority of Americans are committed to stand with Ukraine, as are the majority of Germans. That is incredibly important. And it's really important that we continue to build new bridges in our alliances with Germany, Europe, and in the Indo-Pacific. Transatlantic security is intimately connected to this conference focus. Trade, tech, 
and transformation. As innovation moves forward at an exponential rate, we need to apply what we've learned from our cooperation and collaboration to future technological challenges. Future economic growth will largely be driven by advances in artificial intelligence, in biomedical sciences, and the green economy. And these are three areas that as president of the University of Pennsylvania, I was heavily invested in, in moving them forward at the level of discovery and seeing those discoveries move into the marketplace, including with BioNTech, which is in Mainz, Germany, and a partnership between a then small company and Pfizer propelled by messenger RNA technology that was discovered at the University of Pennsylvania. That's our future, and it will be critical to us leaning into that future to advance our economies and the global economy and to stand up to global challenges. Autocratic countries also work really, really hard to establish global rules based on their own values. Their values do not call for a level playing field. They do not call for a free press. They do not call for a free civil society or open markets, let alone democratic practices. We need to take our own side in this argument. And if we don't take our own side, we know others will not 